Well, good morning and welcome to Salem Chapel. We're so glad that you chose to worship with us today. If it's your first Sunday here, would you take a moment to let us know that you are here by filling out that card that you received on the way in. As you exit the service today, if you would just drop that off at the welcome table in the lobby, we'd love to give you a gift to say thank you for coming. If it's your first week here online, would you also take a moment to let us know that you stopped by by visiting hello.salemchapel.org and fill out that form and a member of our team will reach out to you this week. Well, church, this is the holiday season and one of my most favorite things that we do as a church is to celebrate Christmas with the families of Kimberly Park Elementary School. We do this through a Christmas toy store fundraiser for the school. We collect toys that the school can then in turn sell in a low cost toy store where the funds from the sales of those toys go back into the school itself as well. There's a lot of ways you could be a part of that. One is to collect toys and you can find an updated list of toys that have been requested by visiting our website at salemchapel.org slash Christmas with KP. You can also find a form there to sign up as a volunteer in one of the many ways that we have to serve our families on December the 11th when we host a toy store here at Salem Chapel. I hope you check that out and sign up to be a part of this very special tradition that we do each and every year. Well, church, let's go ahead and stand at this time and get ready for worship. It is good to be here. Um, I'm excited to get into the word. Um, but before I do that, I just want to make sure I honor Pastor uh, Johnny. Um, it was just, man, you've been awesome. Y'all got a really awesome pastor, man. The first time we met was over Zoom. Yeah. Um, and the first time we talked, I just kind of knew, like, man, I like this dude. He's a, that's a good dude right there. Um, but even better than him is that woman over there. <laughs> My favorite person in the world, the most beautiful woman in the world, and that is uh, uh, indeed a fact. She is the most beautiful woman in the world. Her name is Adi Anisis Tan. That's my beautiful bride, and I love you. So if you got your Bibles, meet me in John chapter 2. Gospel of John chapter 2. In the first service, I had, I had the guys stand up and read it. Um, and so it wouldn't be fair if I didn't ask you to do it, right? But who cares? I got it. Don't worry about it. <laughs> I did that because I didn't have the, the Wi-Fi, but everything has worked out, and we got it. So if you had John chapter 2, if you got it, say, I got it. Yeah. If not, say, hold on, I chill. <laughs> All right, sounds good. Uh, would you stand with me? I'll read it, but... Let's stand for uh, the reading of the word of God. John chapter 2, verses 13 through 25. The Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple, he found those who were selling oxen and sheep and pigeons and the money changers sitting there. And making a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and oxen. And he poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. And he said to those who sold the pigeons, take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of trade. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. So the Jews said to him, what sign do you show us for doing these things? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews said, it has taken 46 years to build this temple, and you will raise it up in three days. But he was speaking about the temple of his body. When, therefore, he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that, it had been, that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. Now, when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, many believed in his name when they saw the signs that he was doing. But Jesus, on his part, did not entrust himself to them because he knew all people and needed no one to bear witness about man for he himself knew what was in man pray with me father we thank you for your amazing grace and mercies that are new every morning we are here lord to hear from you we pray lord that you would open our hearts and minds to to receive your word this morning Lord, I'm a weak man, 
and I can do nothing without you. Use me, O God. Speak through me. Lord, I sinned against you. I perverted what was right, but I didn't get what I deserved. For you delivered me from going down to the pit, and I shall live to enjoy the light of life. I don't deserve to be called a preacher or a pastor or a church planner or any of those things. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and your grace toward me is not in vain. Use me, O oh God. Speak to your people. Bless us, O oh Lord, as we are here to hear from you. We love you because you have indeed loved us first. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. You have heard it said that actions speak louder than words. You've heard that before, right? Right? Okay, there we go. There we go. But I want to tell you today that the word speaks louder than actions. What I mean is this. The word of God is more meaningful, more important, has more authority, more power than any action, any person, any place, anything, anywhere. The word of God speaks louder than actions. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of the Lord endures forever. Man shall not live off bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. There is nothing like the word of God. Nobody like the word of God. No belief system like the word of God and no book like the word of God. I remember a few years ago, uh, my wife and I was watching our best friend's kids, and she went to go pick them up, and she brought them back to, to the house, and she had to go back out, so she left me with the kids, which is always a great idea, because I got it under control. I know what I'm doing. But I got this book in the mail that morning. I couldn't wait to get into the book. Like, I just couldn't wait. And so I take Aaron and Zipporah downstairs to the basement. I get them their snacks, put on Netflix, got them all set up and ready to go. And I tell them, y'all stay down here. I'll be upstairs reading if you need me. And little Zipporah, an eight-year-old girl, she looked up at me and said, are you reading the Bible? I said, no, no, I got, I got something else. And she said, oh, a regular book? It's like, yep, just... <laughs> Just a regular old book. And I will never, ever forget that. What, what great theology she had. I don't care what your favorite book is. I don't care who is your favorite theologian. If it is not the Bible, it's just a regular old book. Paul said in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, we thank God for you because when you received the word of God, you accepted it. Not as a human word, but as it actually is, the word of God. The word speaks louder than actions. That's what I want to talk about this morning. The word speaks louder than actions. And I hope that we can leave here with just these simple truths in our heart. First of all, remember the written word. Remember the written word. Believe the fulfilled word. And finally, receive the incarnate word. Remember the written word, believe the fulfilled word, and receive the incarnate word. Let's begin with remembering the written word. The text says, the Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now, stop right there. The purpose of John's gospel is that we might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. But we must keep in mind something very important. Jesus cannot be the Christ, the Savior of the whole world, of every nation, tribe, and tongue, unless he is first, first Jesus 
the Messiah, the Jewish Messiah. Never strip Jesus of his Jewishness. He was born a Jew to a Jewish mother. He's from the tribe of Judah. He was circumcised. He was dedicated at the temple. He walked like a Jew. He talked like a Jew. He dressed and ate like a Jew. Jesus was a Jew. He was not only Jewish ethnically, he was culturally a Jew. Not only Jew outwardly, but inwardly. Not only a circumcision of the flesh, but circumcision of the heart. The Bible says he was born under the law to redeem those under the law. He fulfilled all the righteous requirement of the law. He is the true Israelite, the son of God. Therefore, when he participates in Passover or any Jewish festival, it is not merely out of religion and tradition. It was out of relationship and truth. It was out of obedience to his father. That's very important for us to establish because you take somebody like the Apostle Paul, for example. Paul, before he got saved, was uh, zealous. He, was, he had passion. But even according to his own admission, his zeal wasn't according to knowledge. Look what he said in Galatians chapter 1. He said, for you have heard of my former life in Judaism, which is religion, how I persecuted the church of God violently and tried to destroy it. And I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age among my people. So extremely zealous was I for the traditions of my fathers. You see, Paul's zeal was for the tradition of his fathers. Jesus' zeal was for the tradition of his father. And that is a big difference. No doubt there were faithful worshipers there in Jerusalem at Passover. But many of them have become more, it's, it's become more about religion and tradition than it was relationship and truth. And we need to be careful of that ourselves. We need to be very careful of becoming more zealous for our ethnic group than for God. We need to be very careful of be becoming more zealous for our country than for God. We need to be very careful of becoming more zealous for our denominations and our little cliques and squads than for God. There is a time to celebrate Jerusalem. And there is a time to cry over Jerusalem. There is a time to make tables. And there is a time to flip tables. The text says, in the temple, he found those who were selling oxen and sheep and pigeons and the money changers sitting there and making a whip of cords. He drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and oxen and poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. I like that. I really do. I like to see that Jesus gets mad. I know we think of Jesus as just this nice, sweet guy, but it's good to know that we serve a Lord who actually gets mad at injustice, gets mad at oppression. We serve a Lord who has emotions. We can't strip him of his Jewishness. We can't strip him of his emotions. Jesus was angry. And I don't know what y'all call it down here, but uh, where I'm from in Philly, we would say, and Jesus ain't sweet. He is not sweet. He ain't weak. He ain't soft. He's not just skipping around, happy all the time, everything is great. He is full of grace, of course. But that doesn't mean he's just nice all the time. There is a time to be appropriately angry. The Bible says, be angry, but do not sin. Jesus here is righteously and appropriately angry. But the question is, why? Why? What, what made him so angry? Why is he flipping tables and doing all of this stuff, making a whip? What makes him so angry? Is he just walking around looking for things to be mad about? 
Is this what he needs to like get himself going before he goes into public ministry? Is he doing what Michael Jordan used to do? Did y'all see, um, what is it called again? The Last Dance. Y'all seen that documentary? Somebody said, oh yeah. In The Last Dance is a, is a documentary about Michael Jordan. And uh, he tells us a lot, he exposes a lot about himself that maybe many people didn't know. But one thing is, uh, he knew that he played the best when he was angry. And so he would use anything he could as motivation, something that would make him angry. No matter how petty or insignificant it was, he would use it. And if he couldn't find something, he'll make it up. And so one of the best examples, crazy example, is was a guy named uh, LeBrafford Smith. Anybody know LeBrafford Smith? Yeah, it's a reason why you don't know <laughs> LeBradford Smith was a young player who really wasn't all that great, but he had his best game, like the game of his life, playing against Michael Jordan. LeBradford Smith in his game against Michael Jordan had 37 points. And just so happened that game, Jordan had one of his worst games. He only had like 15 points. But Jordan's team did win. But that wasn't good enough for him. He didn't like the fact that this little insignificant guy had 36 points. And according to Jordan, after the game, LeBradford walked by him and said, hey, Mike, nice game. And Mike said, that was all I needed. I took that personal. And the very next night, they played against each other. And Michael Jordan made it his business to destroy LeBradford Smith. He wanted to humiliate him. LeBradford Smith had 37 points. Mike had 36 in the first half. He did everything he could to destroy him. And we never really heard of LeBrafford Smith since. One writer said that uh, LeBrafford would be in the history books under things not to say to Michael Jordan. <laughs> All because of nice game, Mike. But here's the thing. He never even said it. <laughs> Mike made it up. He never said it. He just made up something to be angry about in order to humiliate and embarrass this young kid. And I only say that to say, this is not what Jesus is doing. Jesus is not here just making stuff up. He, he's not out to get us. He doesn't want to humiliate us, but he does want to humble us. He wants to purify us. He took this personal because it was personal. He said, take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of trade. This is his father. This is very personal. Jesus here is appropriately and righteously angry. He is disgusted with the dishonor of the house of his father. What it was supposed to be about righteous reverence had become an irreligious rejection of God's word. This is a reason to be angry, church. First of all, they were selling the sacrificial animals. And this actually started as a convenience. This was a, a, a good thing. People who had to travel such a long way to, to get to Jerusalem, instead of bringing their sacrificial animals in that long travel, they would buy the, the animal that they needed in Jerusalem and then take it into the temple to worship. The same thing with the money changers. In order to make an offering, you had to exchange your foreign currency for local currency. And then you would go into the temple and worship. And what used to be helpful eventually turned into a system of greed and exploitation. But even worse was that it was now happening on temple ground. The text says that this happened in the temple, the part where the Gentiles were worshiping. They couldn't go but so far. They had to be on the outer courts. And this is happening where the only place they were allowed to even be, so they couldn't even worship in peace. And D.A. Carson, in this commentary, put it this way. He said, instead of solemn dignity and the murmur of prayer, there was the billowing of cattle and the bleeding of sheep. Instead of brokenness and contrition, holy adoration and prolonged petition, there is noisy comrades. 
In other words, it became more about religion and tradition than it was about relationship and truth. That's what made Jesus so angry. And here it is. The disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. They're watching Jesus do all this, and they remember the written word. Zeal for your house will consume me. They have rightly recognized Jesus' zeal for the temple as a fulfillment of Scripture, and therefore a sign that speaks to who he is, the Messiah. What came to their mind was Psalm 69, verse 9, that says, For zeal for your house has consumed me, and the reproaches of those who reproach you have fallen on me. Jesus took it personal because it was personal. And if we are going to interpret the action of Jesus in our lives, we must do it through the written word. We must remember the written word. He may be causing all types of chaos in your life. You can't figure out what's going on. Why is things just all over the place? I can't figure it out. What is, what is God doing? We must interpret it through the written word. We must remember the word. He's not trying to just, just be angry with you for no reason or anything. What God wants to do is purify us. He is serious. He is zealous about the purity of worship. And the only way we will see Jesus for who he truly is, is if we remember the written word. But it doesn't stop there. We can't just remember the word. We got to believe the word. Believe the fulfilled word of God. Text says, so the Jew said to him, what sign do you show us for doing these things? In other words, what? authority do you have who do you think you are who died and made you king what sign do you show us for doing these things they are demanding a sign while denying the sign right in front of them somehow they don't they don't see the psalm 69 they didn't remember the written word they don't see signs or the echoes of jeremiah 7 Zechariah 2 or Zechariah 14 or Malachi 3. They don't see all of these things. And as I was thinking through this and meditating, and uh, I asked my wife, I said, what, what do you think about this? What is going on here? And she said something really profound, and I need you to hear this. She said, they are looking for something outside of the word to make sense of something that can only be interpreted by the word. That, that deserves an amen. That deserves a hand clap, everything. <laughs> they are looking for something outside the word in order to make sense of something you can, that can only be interpreted by the word. They don't see the sign because they don't interpret the word of God. They don't see the sign. But they don't need a sign. In fact, we don't need a sign. What we need is to believe the word of God. Believe the word. You remember the, the story that um, Jesus told about the rich man in Hades, the rich man in Lazarus in Luke chapter 16. The rich man was begging Abraham. He said, yo, man, send Lazarus to warn my family so that they don't come here in this place of torment. And Abraham told him, no, I'm not sending Lazarus. And why? He said, because they have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. In other words, they have the Bible. Let them listen to the word of God. But the rich man said, no, man, no, 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 no. If you send Lazarus, they definitely going to believe if you send somebody from the dead, they're going to repent. And what did Abraham say? He said, if they don't listen to Moses and the prophets, they won't be convinced even if someone rose from the dead. If we do not believe the Bible, 
if the Bible is not enough, then nothing will be enough. Now, I know we all Christians in here and we believe the Bible. But honestly, don't you sometimes ask God for a sign, for a little bit more? You want to see more. And I'm not necessarily saying that's wrong, that we're just trying to, to see something. But it all begins with the Bible. The word is all we need. It is indeed sufficient. Amen. Jesus is making a point. Even if someone rose from the dead, they wouldn't believe if they don't believe the Bible. Yeah. And he does the same thing here with these guys. He's, he answered them, okay, you want a sign? I got you. I got a sign for you. Destroy this temple, and in three days, I will raise it up. The Jews then said, it has taken 46 years to build this temple, and you'll raise it up in three days? But he was speaking about the temple of his body. Jesus was not telling a riddle. It was reality he was speaking about. He meant exactly what he said. But they won't get what he said unless you remember and believe the word of God. And so they missed it. Jesus is not speaking about the temple building. He was speaking about his body. However, just, just as a, a, a side note, just, as, um, just in case you tempted to get it twisted. If he was speaking about the building. If he was speaking about the building, you better believe it would take longer for them to destroy it than for him to raise it back up. We're talking about Jesus Christ, the Lord God Almighty in the flesh. We're talking about the radiance of the glory of God, the exact imprint of his nature. He upholds the universe by the word of his power. By faith, we understand that the universe was created by the word. That's who we're talking about here. He was in the beginning with God. And all things were made through him. And without him was not anything made that was made. That's who we're talking about here. We are talking about he who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him, all things were created in heaven and on earth. Visible and invisible, whether thrones, dominions, powers, rulers, authority, all things were created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. We're talking about Jesus here. If he wanted to talk about the building, he could talk about the building. There's not a problem with him. But he wasn't talking about the building. He was talking about his body. In other words, he was talking about the special and unique presence of God that dwells with his people. That's what it is. The special and unique presence of God that dwells with his people. It's like the garden in the book of Genesis. Where the special and unique presence of God that dwells with his people walked with man in the cool of the day. Like the tabernacle in the book of Exodus, where the special and unique presence of God that dwells with his people led them in a cloud by day and a fire by night. Like the temple in the book of Kings, where the special and unique presence of God that dwells with his people filled the house of the Lord with his glory. Like the chariot in the book of Ezekiel, where the special and unique presence of God that dwells with his people left the temple because of their sin, but he promised to return. And like the word in John chapter 1, where the special and unique presence of God that dwells with his people became flesh and dwelt among us, like the Messiah in our chapter right here, chapter 2 of John, where the special and unique presence of God that dwells with his people returned to the temple like he promised he would and is standing right in front of their face. For in him, the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. Jesus is the temple. And he said, destroy this temple, and in three days, I will raise it. The resurrection 
is the only sign I'm going to give. That's the greatest sign. If you don't believe that, you won't believe anything. And you won't even believe that unless you first believe the word. The resurrection. In fact, if the resurrection didn't happen, then we're all here for nothing. We're literally wasting our time. If the resurrection did not actually happen, we are all fools. And we are still dead in our sins. But praise God that even though they did destroy the temple of his body on the cross, they buried him in a grave. On the third day, he did exactly what he said he would, and he rose from the dead with all power and authority in his hand. Destroy this temple, and in three days, I will raise it. When, therefore, he was raised from the dead, the disciples remembered that he had said this, and here it is, they believed the scripture. They believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. Church, Jesus is the fulfillment of all the scripture. He is where it all culminates. Everything comes together in Jesus. And what a beautiful reality this is. When we place our faith in Jesus on the basis of what the word of God says, not some made up Jesus, not what you heard, not even what you've been taught. Maybe you've been taught some weird, strange things all your life. But in the actual Bible, that Jesus when we believe in that Jesus, what's true of him becomes true of us. The Bible says, don't you know that you are God's temple? And that God's spirit dwells in you. And if anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him. For God's temple is holy and you are that temple. We are the temple of God. Praise the Lord God Almighty. What a wonderful, beautiful reality. We are the place where the special and unique presence of God dwells, us. That is, of course, if you are in Christ. If you are an actual believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. Text goes on and says, now, when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, Many believed in his name when they saw the signs he was doing. But Jesus, on his part, did not entrust himself to them because he knew all people and needed no one to bear witness about man, for he himself knew what was in man. If you're taking notes, put your pen down for a second. We all need to hear this. Fascination does not mean faith. Fascination does not mean faith. There are many people who think they are Christians, who think they are in Christ simply because they are fascinated with Jesus. But the Bible says the Lord knows who are his. And if Jesus doesn't claim you, if he doesn't entrust himself to you and you are not his he knows all men he knows all people he knows our hearts he knows the difference between faith and fascination if you think you know God think again think about if God knows you we must be known by God. He has to entrust himself to us. Matthew chapter 7 says, On that day many will say, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Cast out demons in your name? And do mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Church, I was one of those people. I thought I was a Christian. I was searching for answers. And when I say searching, I mean searching. I was on Google. And I was on YouTube. And I was, and I had questions. And I 
and I was watching debates and, and lectures and sermons. And my number one question that I needed an answer to was, did Jesus actually rise from the dead? Actually, physically, historically, did he actually rise from the dead? And I began to fall in love with this thing called apologetics. And I knew all the arguments. I was absolutely convinced that Jesus rose from the dead. There was nothing, no doubt in my mind. I knew he rose from the dead. And I would go and I would just pick fights with people and argue because I just wanted to prove to them that Jesus rose from the dead. But I was not a Christian. I was fascinated with Jesus, but that did not make me a Christian. It was one day and I picked up the Bible and I read the Bible and I got to Matthew chapter 5 and it said this, you have heard it said that you shall not commit adultery, but I say to you that anyone who looks at a woman with lust has committed adultery with her in his heart. I realized it was a heart issue. It was a problem of the heart. And I, and I threw my Bible down. I said, God, if you want me to be this type of person, you're going to have to do it. And the moment I said those words, it all came and, and, and made sense. It just clicked for me. And I said, oh, Jesus is not just a fascinating historical figure. I actually need him. The cross, his death on the cross is not just real. It was necessary. His resurrection is not just real. It's necessary. I need Jesus. And I knew that there was no action I could perform that was louder than the word of God. I needed him, the incarnate word of God. He is more meaningful. He is more important. He has more authority. He has more power than any action, any person, place, or thing anywhere. Church, we must receive the word of God. Believe me, the word speaks louder than actions. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you for your word. Thank you, Lord, for the gospel of Jesus Christ, for your death, your resurrection, your ascension. Thank you that you have promised to return to make all things right. Thank you, Lord, that in you we have life. Thank you for forgiveness of sins. Lord, if there is anyone here under the sound of my voice who is fascinated with you but don't have true faith, I pray that you would convict their hearts this morning, that they might turn to you in believing faith. And I thank you for your amazing grace. We love you, Lord, because you have indeed loved us first. In Jesus' name.